The name of this lecture is Torah and Science. We as Jews, we call in history the nation of the book. The Goim, the Gentiles, always in history named us in the last 3,319 years since we received the Torah in Mount Sinai. They called us the nation of the book. I would like to share some statistics with you to give you some ideas about contribution of Jews to humanity. There is no nation in the world that contributed more as far as intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, art, science, medicine, religion, and many other different aspects. There is no nation that contributed even 1% of what the Jews contributed to this world. No nation in history, even though, for instance, the Persian, the Muslims nation, they're very talented in many fields, more than the average Gentiles, but even they did not contribute nothing compared to what Jews gave humanity. It's just enough that everybody that knows a little bit history knows that until the Torah was given to the Jews in front of 15 million witnesses, the, the first solid constitution started in the world. Until that day, the world was a different place to live in. <coughs> Until 4,200 years ago, the flood that killed millions of people in this world and covered the entire world in the time of Noah, the world was, if you're strong, you survive. The strongest in nature, they're in charge of the weakest. There was no regulation, no rules. Whoever is stronger is in charge. For instance, if a person had a wife, there was no marriage constitution yet. Marriage started 3,319 years ago when the Jews received the Torah. Until that moment, a person would like a girl. He likes to be with her together. That's it. They decide they want to live together. But if somebody stronger than him would come and like her, he's gonna, he says to him, I want her. No, it, she's mine. No, she's mine. They begin to fight. Whoever is going to kill the other will win against this girl. Of course, she doesn't have any problems with that, because if she opens her mouth, they're going to kill her also. And this is the way it was. So in every tribe, there was a strong person, strong, charismatic. He was threatening the rest, and he was in charge. This is the way the world was. Once the Jews received the Torah with the Ten Commandments and the rest of the laws, it made a huge impact all over the world. For those who do not know, the Torah was translated to 70 different languages in the first generation. All, every civilized world, every civilized country adopted right away the laws of the Ten Commandments and many other laws from the Torah. The problem is that more than 80% of the laws in the Torah are against human logic. And that's what gave the Goim, the Gentiles, many, many problems. Why? Because they could not understand, for instance, all the laws of sacrifices. They did not understand the Passover rules. They have to clean the house for breadcrumbs and all these things. They did not know the laws of Shabbat, all these weird things that the religious Jew do on Shabbat. They did not know that. So many of the laws they cut off. But the laws that made sense to them, they adapted into their religion right away, into their society. Tonight, the purpose of this lecture, if anybody that sits in this room has a doubt that the written Torah was really given to us, to the Jews, by the Creator of the world, in the, in the next hour you will not have any more doubts. If anybody here has a doubt, that the oral Torah, what we call Torah Shebe'al Peh, that was transferred from rabbis to rabbis throughout the generation, if the oral Torah is the word of God or the rabbis made it up, like some people here may think, tonight your uh, <coughs> questions and your fake problems about this will be over, I hope, because this is usually how it works. But please don't hesitate to challenge me, ask me everything on your mind, because I would rather argue and make the points clear than just make you listen to me and not being convinced. This is a little bit 
about how the world is today. We have 6.4 billion people in the world today. Christians are 33%, Muslims 19%, Hindus 13%, Buddhists 5%, which is hundreds of millions of people, and Jews 0.025%. How many Jews we have in the world, believe it or not, only 13.2 million all over the world. We are the smallest nation in the entire world. Even the American Indians, even though you never hear about them, they have more than 13.2 million people. They spread in some countries, but they are more than us. But this is a very, very serious question, what's going on here. For those who know history a little bit, the Jews and the Chinese nation started in the same generation. After the flood, when all the people in the world died, there was only eight people survived. Noah and his three sons, and the, the four wives. Eight people came out of the ark with some animals, and the world started 4,200 years ago. Today, it got to 6.4 billion people. The three sons of Noah are the three fathers of humanity. One of them, his name was Yefet. Yefet in, in English means Jeff. Yefet in, in Hebrew means beauty. He went to the area of Europe. All the Europeans that usually are nice and handsome, they are the descendants of this person called Yefet. Yefet comes from the word Yofi, Yafa. It's pretty, Yefet. So that's one son of Noah. Then he had another son, his name was Ham. Ham means hat, two hats. Ham went to Africa. All the areas of the black people came from this person called Ham. He was the wicked one out of the three. And then there was one called Shem. Shem was the righteous son of Noah from the three. Someone who hates Jews, his name is anti-Shemi, anti-Semite. Why? Because the Jews are grandchildren of this person called Shem. Few generations after, there was a person named Abraham. He was the grand-grand-grandson of, no of Shem. And he was the first serious righteous person in this world. We're talking about 3,600 years ago. And everything started from him, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and then the tribes. And then after we came out of Egypt, after 210 years, we received the Torah in front of millions of people, and that's when Judaism officially started. Up to the time that the Jews received the Torah, we were called the Hebrews. Why our name is Hebrews? Our language called Ivrit. Abraham is the first person in the Torah that his title was Abraham Ivri, the Hebrew Abraham. Why? Because Ivri in Hebrew means one-sided. You are in one side of the world and everybody else are on the opposite side. Abraham was the only person that recognized for the first time that there has to be one God to this creation and he is in charge of everything that happening here. Because up to that moment, every other person was belong to a different cult. Some believe in the sun, some believe in the moon, some in the stars, some in animals, in statues, in the lakes, in the Niles, all kinds of different gods. But when Abraham started to analyze what's going on here in this creation, he started to search for the truth for about 52 years of his life. Age 52, he started to teach people in public that there has to be one God, and that's what the Torah says, all the students of Abraham join him when he left the place, but that's a little bit history. Now, the question that we have to ask, if we started in the same generation like the Chinese, the Chinese was a grandson of Noah. The Torah says, Sini in Hebrew Sin means China, Chinese. We, Shem, was one generation before China. So we are about 20, 30 years older than the Chinese. How come Chinese have close to 2 billion people in China, and this is with, with restriction on birth, and the Jews that started in the same generation should have been 5 billion? How come instead of 5 billion people, we are only 13.2 million Jews? That's a very serious question to ask. I will try to answer it later on. Now, Today, for, that's maybe the opportunity to ask everyone to put their phone on vibration or shut it off like this. We don't have problems later. Uh, now, 
Not that many people know, but today we have more than 80,000 religions and cults in the world. More than 80,000. Just in the United States alone, you have more than 10,000 religions and cults here alone. I'm not talking about China and India and all these places that have full of religions. 10,000 religions in America alone. The first solid religion that started in the world, we got lucky, but it's Judaism. It started 3,319 years ago. What's the next serious religion? Buddhism. When did it start? 2,400 years ago. 2,400 years ago, there was a person called Buddha, and he came and he, he claimed that he saw the light, and he felt spiritual elevation, and that's how he had some followers, and today you have hundreds of millions that follow this religion, Buddhism. Then Christianity, just less than 2,000 years old. Then we're going to talk about it in, in a little while, just to speak a little bit shortly about Christianity. And then 1,400 years ago, Islam. Just less than 1,400 years ago, Muhammad came from the desert, and he claimed that Angel Gabriel gave him the, the Quran. Now, in order for us, in order for us to analyze those religions, I would like to start with speaking about five minutes on Christianity and five minutes in, in, about Islam. But before I start that, I would like to make one point very clear. Please do not forget what I'm just telling you, because you, you will have to remember it through the entire lecture. When a person comes to prove that a book is divine, it's the word of God, it takes maximum five minutes to prove that the book is not the word of God. To prove that it's the word of God, it's harder. To prove that it's not the word of God, it's very easy. Why? All you have to do is to bring one mistake in the book, and you know right away God does not make mistakes. So rule number one, scientific rule is, if God, the creator of the world, which is so powerful and so special, gave a book to the people he created, obviously we cannot find any mistake in this book. But before we even speaking about the book of God, usually when I start a lecture like this, I started much before. I first argue with people if God exists or not. Why? Believe it or not, there are some people in the world that have doubts if the, if the world has a God or not. But the point is like this. You cannot go and, and design your faith and your belief based on what happened to your personal life or to your nation, or to your family. When you make money, God exists. When you don't make money, oh, I don't think God exists. When there was a Holocaust, for sure God doesn't exist. When the Jews got Israel and they won against all the Arabs, God is with us. When your basketball team wins, God exists. When they lose, there's no God. It doesn't work that way. How do we know there is a creator to this world? It's very simple. Every creation always had a creator. You will never find a creation, an intelligent creation, that did not have a designer, did not have a creator. The more sophisticated is the creation, it indicates about the brilliance of the creator. Which means, to make a, a little can here like this, you don't need to be a genius. You learn one or two days and you know how to make it. To make a laptop computer, you got to be much more advanced. To make an F-16 jet, you got to be a serious person. You cannot just everybody can come and make a jet, right? So the more sophisticated is the creation, it indicates about the brilliance of the creator. Everybody has to agree with me that if you search in the entire world, you will not find anything more sophisticated than the human brain. If you take a brain of a person, it's the size of an apple. This little box has 80% liquid inside, 80%. So that's very little left after you take off all the water. The brain is really like a, a little box. 
There is 10 trillion connections in this brain. 10 trillion connections. What does it mean? 10 billion multiplied by a thousand. In one little brain the size of an apple. If you connect them all together, all the wires inside the brain, connect them and stretch it, it will go all the way to the moon and come back. That's how long it's going to be. If you take all the telecommunications in the world, all the satellites, the phone company, the television stations, all the wires, all the entire communication system in the entire world is not going to be 1% from one person's brain. As dumb as he may be, that person, is still 100 times more sophisticated than all the telephone companies in the world together. This is a brain of one person. Not only that, if you take one wire out of the brain or disconnect one wire, the person may not be able to move or to talk. It's like almost like a dead person. From 10 trillion wires and connections, you disconnect one of them, a person may be paralyzed. Not only that, if you take a wire from the brain and you look at that, it's going to be... One thousand of a piece of an air. If you take an air out of your head and you look at that in the sun, you don't see it. Now take a hair and divide it in the, in the, uh, in the thickness of the hair to a thousand. That's how thin it is. And it's all inside the brain connected in such a strange way. And to come and think that something like this was made with an explosion is going to be serious. So the question that I'm asking, how there is respectable professors in colleges in the last hundred years that stand in front of respectable people and tell us all this nonsense, that this in, in amazing world with trillions of creations and all one connect to the other was made by coincidence, accident, explosion, random explosion, and the world became a sophisticated world. I'll make a deal with you. You take 10 coins. You throw it on the floor. And then I will give you the same 10 coins and you throw it a million times. Are you going to be able to throw the 10 coins the same way like the first time? Never. Random, it's not in your hand. Nothing can happen by accident. Everything has to be planned. For, for those who know a little bit about atoms and neutrons, about physics, you know that as much as you scramble material, they're always going to fight against you and come back to the right order, which indicates, or if you know a little bit about DNA, you know of fingerprints or eye prints, you know right away that this world could never be created by an accident. has to be a creator. The more you learn about your body, you fall in love with your creator. Now the question that you ask next, okay, there is a creator. What's in it for me? What do I care? Okay, someone created me. So I'm here now. I'm walking, I'm eating, I'm talking, I'm swimming. What do I care there is a creator or not? Rule number two, remember, if there is a creation, every creation has a purpose. We never found in history something that was made by someone without a purpose. A table has a purpose, for sure. A chair has a purpose, for sure. Everything is designed according to its purpose. Why the laptop is like this, that you'll be able to hold it, to open it, to close it, that you won't catch too much room in your bed. Everything was planned in advance. The rugs, the, the lights, the walls, everything is designed. The tables have four, chair, four legs. Why not three? Because we're not going to use it if it had three. So everything has a purpose. So now, is it possible to think that the most advanced machine, the most sophisticated creation, which is the human being, has no purpose? Why the Creator made people? Why the Creator made more than two million different species, more than two million animals we know? There's much more. That's what we know. The scientists, they know about more than two million different kinds of animals. The most sophisticated animal is the human being. Just below us, you have the monkeys, the chimpanzee, which are very intelligent. They look a little bit like us, some more, some less. But we know that we are the most intelligent and the most advanced people from all the creation. We're in charge. 
we have wisdom, we have free choice, we have things that the animal don't have. Is it possible to think that my creator put me in this world for no purpose? The answer is of course not. I have a purpose. Now, the next question, if I have a purpose, in that case, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? How am I going to know why, what I was created for? The answer to it is, you have to search. It's impossible to think that the creator of the world will create so many people, so many generations in such an advanced world and will not teach the people why he made them for. So now, before we're going to talk about the Torah, before we even get into the Torah, we can get to it with our own common sense. Many philosophers, Goim, if you know a little bit history, Greeks, Romans and others, they wrote fantastic books about the purpose of life. Some of them got to the truth without the Torah. They knew what's the purpose of life. Free choice, good and bad, all these things that we have, they got to it. They already realized there has to be life after life. This is 2,000 years ago without the Torah. And they wrote it based on their common sense. We can also do it. We're not less than them. Let's think about it one minute. If I have a purpose and I'm different than all the animals, what makes me different than all the animals? Let's think. Huh? Getting nervous here. What's the purpose? Let's think. If God made us to eat, to enjoy food, we would become animals. The animals have plenty of food, as much as they want. The dog comes to the garbage, what happened to him? Chinese, Italian, Persian, Israeli food. It just depends which bag he rips. Now remember, dogs don't suffer when they eat your leftover. A person that takes from the garbage, he suffers very much. It's humiliating him. But the dog doesn't suffer, he enjoys, he licks the, the bones. For him it's a top five star restaurant. <laughs> so food, if the purpose of the creation was to enjoy food, we would become another animal. We don't need to be so intelligent. But it's better. 90% of the people in the world have difficulties to get food. There are hundreds of millions of people in the world that cannot even get a spoon of rice a day. You know how many people are dying from starvation? They cannot even get a, a, one, one piece of bread a day. So if the purpose of the creation was to eat, why are there so many people who don't even eat a, a piece of bread? So that has to be that it's not the, the purpose. What's the next thing? To enjoy life? To have fancy life? To drive fancy car? To swim? To, be, to, to enjoy playing golf? To go on vacation? Why 99.9% .9 of the people in the world don't have it? If that was the plan of the Creator, He would make everybody with this kind of abilities. Obviously, that's not the purpose. What's the purpose? To be healthy? To watch our health? There are many people with sicknesses. That's not the purpose. Who can raise his hand here and tell me, without speaking about the Torah, what is the purpose of life? I'm still looking for the first person that will know it without the Torah. What's the purpose of life? What are we living for? What do you say? Just to live? You could be a chimpanzee. He has much better life than us. He has five wives. The chimpanzee doesn't have to buy her a drink. He doesn't have to make the show. He doesn't have to report how much money he makes before he go on a date with her. He doesn't have to go to the lawyer and to the rabbis and to get married and to get divorced. He doesn't have all this headache. What's the answer? Yeah. Life after death? That's the purpose of this life? I say without the Torah. Analyzing our society, our life, looking around us, trying to investigate the purpose of life. Is it possible to know for sure what's the purpose of life? I have one idea. Yeah, go ahead. For me, it's to be surrounded by people who love me and to love people who surround me and not hate. And then, you could and become a perfect chimpanzee with friends around you. The chimpanzee, they jump, they play together in a branch zoo, they hug, they kiss, no, he, he has a lot of children. Yeah. There's only one purpose and that's it. You have a good question. I'm speaking about the main purpose. You're right, there are sub-purposes. I'm talking about the main purpose. 
Does God have something to do with the other? I say without religion, based on analyzing society, without the Torah, yeah. To give. To give? Animals give one another. Did you see how the animals protect one another? Animals risk their life to save others. So they give. They're very generous animals. What about improving your life every day? Making it better than the other day? What do you call better? <coughs> Define for me what's better. To make more money? Just improving your personality, your thoughts. Who what needs that? Who needs this? Everyone what are we going to get no. by it? Uh, I was 20%, now I'm 80%. I'm a much better person. What did I get by that? No, what is the... There's this new book that says Purpose of Life. Truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What is that? Is that truth? But we'll see in a minute. Survival of the fittest? Surviving? Oh, the fittest. The purpose of one being is to, uh, to do whatever it takes to survive. But like I say, all the things you say, animals have the same thing. Rabbi, I'm, looking, I'm looking for an answer that makes you different than the animals. Rabbi, yes. why do you keep comparing animals to human beings? Ah. I mean, you always, anyone that says anything, you just compare them to animals. Yeah. We, are, we are a different species. It's like saying, you know what? Go and try to find me a pistachio that's bigger than a watermelon. Yeah, no, I want to ask you a question. Can, can you tell me one thing that we better than the animals? You, can, you have brain capacity. What do you mean, Roger? The I'm, only difference that we have biologically between us and animals yeah. is our brain capacity. Okay, I have news for you. Butterflies can locate one of the other 60 miles away. Can you locate your wife from 60 miles away without yes. saying <laughs> Chimpanzee, I'll show you a clip. Chimpanzee, they made a machine. On the screen of the machine, they show ten numbers. One, two, three, in different, different places on the screen. The chimpanzee has to press from one to ten in the right order. Every time he does it in the right order, two peanuts are falling from that machine. And the chimpanzee hardly even look at the screen. He goes like this and he remembers. They show him the ten numbers, then he disappeared from the screen, and he goes like this, he remembers, and, to, and they took the best students in universities, and they failed all the time. They couldn't remember ten numbers by heart. So the brains have much, they have much better brain, brain than us. So yeah. it's only the humans that are here for a purpose, not the animals? The animals also have a purpose. Yeah. I'm asking what's our purpose, what do we care about just the purpose of the animals? Just to be, just huh? to be. Just to be. I miss the moment. To be? Yes. To be? You contradicting, you contradicting what I just said. I just told you that no creation was made just to be. Why? Every creation has a purpose. A car wasn't made just to stand in a garage. A car was made to serve you in something. Yes. A different state of mind. What do you call higher? It's a good point. What do you call higher? What's for you higher? To be free here? Huh? No, no, no. What? A different state of mind, a higher being. You have to be more specific. What do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make a difference while you're living in your while you're living your life to make a difference. Okay, let's move to the next step. All right. I think I think we can conclude. I think we can conclude that nobody in the world, nobody in the world, can swear on his life that he knows the purpose of life. He can imagine, he can try, he can guess, but really nobody knows what's the purpose of his creations. Why? Why? One reason: because we are ignorant. Why we are ignorant? Not that we're stupid, don't get me wrong. We can be doctors, we can be lawyers, we can be a genius in computers, everybody with his own specialty. We are ignorant in the book of the Creator. We never read carefully the manual of the Creator. Now I want to make a claim here. This is what I claim. I have a book. I'm holding it in my hand. I have a book. This book it's the guideline, the manual of the creation and the purpose of life. Who gave it to me? My creator. Your creator, her creator. He gave it to me. Now, if I'm right, it would be very foolish to live here 78 years without knowing what I'm supposed to do here. 
because I'm wasting my life. Everybody understand that. Now, if I'm not right, if I'm not convinced 100% that this is the book of God, it will be very foolish to sacrifice all my life, follow the laws of this book, not knowing 100% the creator of the world gave it. If a crook gave it, if a false prophet made it up, he's going to fool me and I'm going to waste 70 years, 80 years of my life following his laws. In the end, I get gurnished. For instance, I'll give you an example. All these Muslims that go to the mosque on Friday, they hear a Qadi that encourage them to commit suicide and kill innocent Jews. They hear it all the time, constantly, every Friday, every lecture they go, they hear it. Once in a while, some of them anyway have bitter life. The Qadi just promised yesterday that if I'm going to explode on 20 Jews and kill them, I go to heaven. What's heaven going to be? 72 virgin beautiful waiting for him and make a party for him and dance for him. That's what he believes. So now he goes, he kills himself. He comes right away to hell. No 72 dancers, no nothing. Arafat is waiting for him. <laughs> and that's what happened. You can be very critical if you're ignorant. Why? You can be fooled easily. You can follow different ways and in the end you get nothing. Not only you gain nothing, you lost a lot. He lost his life and he's going to get punished for being a murderer. So this is just an example. When you're ignorant, you pay a very heavy price. In my last lecture here, I gave an example. When I started to work on a computer, I did not know anything. Somebody got me the software. He taught me ABC. What do I know? One day I decided to answer emails. <laughs> I got to do it. People send me lots of email every day. But then I decided to send an email to many people. I have a list. But I didn't know that you can press one button and send it to thousands of people in one shot. So what is a fool does? He makes the email, send it to one guy. It's over. Now I have to type it again, send it to another guy. Another five minutes. Type it again, send it to another guy. By the, by the end of the hour, I send it to ten people. Then I sit all day, ten, days of, ten hours of my life were gone, I send it to fifty people. And it happens to me for real. Not that many hours, I'm not that fool. God saved me. He sent me a guy into the house. What are you doing? So I'm sending emails. He said, no. It's not the way to send emails. I show you. Tak, 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 tak. In less than a minute, hundreds of people got the email. No problem. Why am I telling you this story? Ignorance is the biggest danger to a person's life. More than sicknesses, more than cancer, more than divorce, more than all kinds of other problems, because ignorant could be critical. Now, if there is a God, if there is a Creator, and He gave His book, rule number one, He never errors. Why? He cannot make mistakes. What's the problem? He gave a brilliant book, one or two mistakes, it's possible, so what's the problem? No. If he's the creator of the world and he command me what to do, what not to do, if I'm going to find that he made one mistake, I cannot rely on him ever again. Maybe Shabbat is the second mistake. Maybe Tfilin is the second mistake. Maybe Kosher, not Kosher, is the second mistake. Everything he commanded me is subject to be an error. Why should I waste my time? I'm going to do all these things, and in the end, he said, well, excuse me, no, I made some mistake. It's impossible. If he supervised such a fantastic world, and he created everything from nothing, and he writes about him in his book that he's not capable of making mistakes, he can do everything he wants, he controls everything in every given second, everything is calculated, and everything is supervised. That's the way he describes himself in his book. Therefore, if I'm going to find one mistake, I know this book is not from him. Somebody is lying to me. Let's show what the Muslims have to sell us. Muhammad came one day from the desert, and he said that Angel Gabriel gave him the Quran. Rule number one, he did not bring any witnesses. So right away, it started with 50% doubt. Nobody ever saw it. Everybody can come now from the desert and say that God spoke to him. Maybe yes, maybe not. 50-50. Then when we begin to read the Quran, we find very ridiculous problems. For instance, this is the Quran, this is the sources. If you want, copy it, and don't show it to your Muslim friends here in town. 
Because you don't want problems with them, but there you, are none. you... Huh? There are none. There are none? Okay. <laughs> well, I've just been in Beverly Hills uh, three months ago in the area there, and one of the teachers over there told me, believe it or not, that there are many Muslims over there, and they intermarry with the Jews now. Yes. The girls bring Muslims guy now. And she, they want me to come there for, for a seminar and to speak to these girls. I say, Persian girls bringing Muslims to the... You say, yeah. They look 100% like the Jews, they come, and they're not fanatic like the Muslims in Iran, and, they, and that's it. The parents cannot do anything about it. I hope it's not going to happen here. Now, so here is, a, here is a page from the Quran. For those who know history, Pharaoh and Haman lived a thousand years apart. Pharaoh was 3,400 years ago, Haman was 2,400 years ago in Iran. Now, the Quran said that Pharaoh and Haman had a meeting and their advisor were sinners. And Pharaoh said, my servants, I know you have no God but me. And then he told Haman, light the fire and create a building for me that I can go up to the top of the tower and look to the God of Moshe because I think he's a liar. That's what Pharaoh said according to the Quran. He never said it, but the interesting part is that Pharaoh and Haman had a meeting. The fool that wrote that, that book did not know the chronological order of the generations. Yeah, there wasn't only one Pharaoh, there was so many Pharaohs. The last Pharaoh 3,400 years ago, when the Jews came out of Egypt. That was the last Pharaoh. Egypt was destroyed after that, that's it. Now, so remember what I'm saying. Now why do we care why the Quran has to say, I'm sure none of you wants to become a Muslim. I'm sure none of you wants to become a Christian. I'm sure. Why am I showing you this? The reason I'm showing you that is I want to show you that it takes five minutes to show, to prove scientifically that two billion Christians wasting all their life on garbage and one and a half billion Muslims wasting all their life on garbage and 13.2 million Jews, they are the only nation that really have the truth. They are not bothered with the truth. Only maybe a million of them touch it, and 12 million live their life like Goim, and they don't care about the truth. It's interesting. How is it possible? We'll see. And Pharaoh told Haman, create the tower that I can go because I think that the God of Moshe is a liar. This is the surahs, this, this is the sources in the Quran. Yes. Uh, if there is a mistake, uh, why do they have so many followers and why does it last so many years? I want to ask you a question. Today, when you search in America, you take a million youth, 16, 17, 18, most of them smoke drugs or most of them don't smoke drugs? In America? In America. 80% for sure smoke drugs. 80%, without a doubt. Is that an indication that to smoke drugs is good? That's one proof. Second proof, most people make sex crimes with any woman they meet on the street knowing they can catch a disease and finish their life. They still do it. Why? It's not positive. It's negative. They can't control their desires. Most people in the world are intelligent or not so bright. Most people in the world, don't look at New York that you see a lot of successful people that went to good universities. If you search through the entire world, most people are analphabetic. They have not even a drop of intelligence. Whatever they've been told, they believe. Think about it. If they come and take a 20 years old guy and say, go commit suicide and kill innocent people, you go to heaven, and right away jump and does it, it doesn't show that he's such an intelligent person. I know, but after but so many years, people would realize, okay, this is mistake. Uh, what do you think? They show them this, they you mean. think they show them these mistakes in the mask? They don't, they don't show them. I had a debate with a Christian professor a few months ago. Three, three hours. I showed him 50 different problems in the New Testament, and in the end, what did he say? You put me in a hole, I don't know how to come out of there. 31 years professor in a Christian university in Manhattan. 31 years he teach Christianity. The head of the missionaries here. He made a lot of Jews Christians. What happened? He came in front of the crowd, 700 people were sitting in a crowd, and in the end he said, I don't know, I couldn't answer one question that I asked him. Not to one. I asked him 50 questions, he couldn't answer one. Until this day, I'm still waiting, I told him, answer me three from the 50 and we continue. Not one he can answer. So all these billions and billions of people that are Muslim, who have 
thousand, three thousand years. Yes. Have stayed stupid according to this? No, no. Ignorance doesn't ignorant. mean you're stupid. They They're ignorant. Yes. So uh, they have I have news ignorant. for you. Yeah. Ninety percent of the Jews in the world are nothing better. How many Jews in the world keep Shabbat? Shabbat, according to God's law, it's the covenant between the creator of the world and his family, the Jewish nation. And the Torah says in 12 different times, if you want to belong to my nation, you have to accept this covenant that we're making here today. What is it? To observe Shabbat. You should not create any, fi any, sh any fire in the seventh day. No fire. That's what the Torah says. How many Jews listen to it? Most Jews in the world are not even aware of that. So does that mean they're stupid? No, they just never heard about the Torah or they never had the chance to learn it. That's not an indication of stupidity. Now, here is another mistake in the Quran and we move on. The wife of Pharaoh all of a sudden became the mother of Moshe. We know that the Torah told us that Batya, the daughter of Pharaoh, found Moshe in the Niles and adopted him. The one who wrote the Quran made a very stupid mistake. And the wife of Pharaoh said, this baby will come for me, don't kill him. He may help us later on. And all of a sudden, another mistake in the Quran, Miriam, the sister of Moshe and Aaron, she lived 3,300 years ago, as the Torah describes her. When they wrote the Quran, Miriam, the sister of Moshe, became Miriam, the mother of J.C. Penny. <laughs> you got it? 1300 years difference, the same Miriam they made her. Look, here, this is the source right here. You don't know who's JC Penny? Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Well, one thing, one thing I wanted to say. One thing I want. I want everybody to know, I'm sorry that I'm not looking to this side, I just have to look to the majority. But shh, I want everybody to understand, Christianity and Islam adopted Judaism as the truth. The Christians call our religion the Old Testament, and they just claim God gave them a second part. But they all admit that the Jews received the Torah in Mount Sinai, nobody denies it. Every priest in the world will tell you that Jews are the nation of the book. God gave them the book. The Muslims, the same thing. It's in the Quran. This is the nation of Musa, Moshe, that God gave them the book. Therefore, since they admit that the Torah is the word of God, they have a very serious problem. What is the problem? That their book must comply with the book of the Torah. If we see that the Torah say A and their book say B, it cannot be that God doesn't know what he wrote in his first book and he came in the other book and wrote the opposite. That's why we have a lot of problems here. here. Maria brought the baby in her hand to the people of her town. Which baby? Which baby? JC. Oh, Maria! This is in the Quran. Oh, Maria! What a strange thing you brought to us. Oh, the sister of Aaron. Your father wasn't an evil person, and your mother was not a prostitute. And Maria, the daughter of Amram, the sister of Aaron, and the daughter of Amram. Who is this Maria that they're talking about? Miriam, the sister of Moshe Rabbeinu. All of a sudden, Miriam, the sister of Moshe, became the Miriam, the father of JC, even though they were 1,300 years different. This is the book of one and a half billion people that kill themselves for this nonsense. You understand what's going on here? That should bother us very much. Why? After you're gonna see that we have the only truth, why we ignore the truth that we got? That's the question. They have nonsense and they die for that nonsense. Five times a day in the middle of the airport they put their mat and pray. For what? Following a book of lies. And we that have the only truth, how many of us read it once? 14 years, I speak almost every night. It's very rare that I have an open night. Many times I speak twice a night. Sometimes three times. This Sunday I have three lectures. Sometimes in the morning in the school, then in the six o'clock in another place, and right away it's 8.30 in another place. I spoke more than 3,000 times. And not once, believe it or not, 
I, I want to cry when I say it. Not once I found one Jew that read the Torah carefully from the beginning to the end. Not once. Why? Why is Not that? once. We have secular Jews, non-religious, that fight against the Torah, scream, make all kinds of comments. I don't believe. Prove. You're lying. The rabbis made it. How can you argue if you never read it once? Imagine if I go... Imagine if I go... No more, no more. Gracias. Gracias. Por favor. Gracias. Okay, now. Again. Just imagine if I go to Harvard University when they have a convention, all the brain doctors came to learn about something new about the brain. And I show up, I come over there, who are you? Doctor whatever. I come inside, I begin to scream. You a fool. You don't know anything you talk about. You're not a doctor. I'm the greatest. I know, you do not know. Whatever you did now, it's nonsense. So then they say to me, excuse me sir, who are you? What is your background? Where you learn to be a doctor? Show us a diploma, something. Did you ever learn once in your life about the brain? You know what a brain surgery is? You ever made a surgery in your life? No. What do I need to... So how do you dare to come tell us that everything we did in the last 30 years, we do not know what we do? 20 years of our life, from morning to night, I make operations. You come and tell me what I do, right or wrong? How would you, would you feel at that moment? Like the biggest fool. But that's, everybody understand. But when it comes to an argument about the Torah, every non-religious Jew is a genius when it comes to the Torah. <laughs> then you ask him, excuse me, sir. No offense, no offense. You know, with all the respect, how many thousands of hours in your life you sat and learned that book that you come to challenge me? I never read it once. Did you read one chapter in the Torah once in your life carefully? Never. So why are you arguing? How can you argue? How can a person make an argument of something he has no idea about? Imagine I do not know anything about stocks. There's a guy 30 years, an investor in Wall Street, in all the companies, the record, everything by heart. I come, I say, that's nonsense. Don't buy it, don't listen to him. How do you know? You do not know? Yeah, I want to show off. That's not the right way. So now, this is Islam. Let's see Christianity, it's much worse. Yes. We're here to learn about Judaism. We're not interested. Okay, there are foul religions. Okay. Yes, yes. Muslim is a stupid religion. Okay. Christianity is Buddhism. Okay. They're all very stupid. Okay. Why are we concentrating on those and not on Judaism? All right, you're right. Let's move on. Thank you. So, okay, so now, <laughs> so based on Harry's quest, in case you agree with her or not, I'm going to skip some. Shh. I wanted to show the reason I, I excuse me? It was necessary. In my opinion, it's necessary. The reason is, you know, when you speak in front of a crowd, there's always different opinions. A speaker has to know to speak in a way that everybody will be satisfied. That is no 100%. The speaker is here to answer the questions. Exactly. Okay, go ahead. If you are here to encourage us, to motivate us, right. to read the book, right. you should be willing to answer all our questions. That's exactly what I'm right. doing. Go ahead. Okay. So. so why is it that we are Jews and we have not read the book? Oh. Why? Why? Why can't you be convinced in your Because you don't have a time. I personally love Do you want me to answer why you never read the book? Is it fair that I'm going to answer for you? No, I'm saying why do you say that a lot of the Jews have not read the Torah? Why not? Because, okay, because the Jews... are ignorant, then they're the same. We are ignorant. No, no, right? okay, yeah. So now, I want to tell you something. Jews do not want to learn the Torah because they don't believe that the Torah is the word of God. That's one of the reasons. Second, that they they afraid that once they begin to read the Torah, they're going to have to change their lifestyle. 
and they are not interested to change their lifestyle. For instance, one guy is a crook in a business. He likes to his customers. He's going to know that once he begins to participate in Torah lectures, it's going to kill him every time he steals. So it's going to bother him and he's going to make less money. So what does he say? Better not to go. You know how many times in my life I heard people call me and say, I apologize, I came to your lecture once, but I'm not going to come ever again. I say, why? Because now I'm already half religious. <laughs> One more lecture, I'm yeah. finished. finished. I so I, I, tell, I tell them I'm surprised at you. Right. I'm showing you the truth. You're avoiding the truth? If I may, yes. if I may yeah. a lot of the times I think a lot of the rabbis are not freeing, are not letting people be free to, they're not welcome. They are very limiting and they put fear into people yes. in order to believe and to um, to want to obey the rules of the Torah as okay. opposed to welcome people, as, as opposed to show them the light, as opposed to show them the way of the Torah. I want to ask you a question. Go ahead. If God would come to you tonight before you fall asleep and speak to you face to face and warn you about something that you do and tell you if you continue to do A, B, C, God forbid I'm going to do this and this to you. He's going to tell you this. Would you have complained against God that is very strict with you? Or you would right away change your, what you're doing? Would you have an argument with him? Don't tell me what to do. Why are you too strict? Why are you scaring me? Would you answer that to him? Or you would say, yes, God, yes, sir, yes, no problem. I'm very sorry. I didn't know. Please forgive me. What would you do? Which one of the two? In my dream? No, in, 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 <laughs> not in a dream. Right now, in front of you, you walk in the street, you see no, the light. That could God only happen as a dream. I don't come to you, but... No, huh? that could only happen as a dream. Don't honestly, worry. Honestly, honestly, um, I don't think God would be like that. I, I don't know. Maybe you know. Okay, you know, know why you, do, you, know, you know why you don't think? Yes, Let's make a deal. Dedicate two hours of your life to read the fifth book of Moses, Sefer Dvarim. Not, not the whole Torah. Just read Sefer Dvarim. I promise you, if you read Sefer Dvarim, you'll be amazed how strict is God. You won't believe how strict he is. If you read it once, don't listen to me. I'm nothing. I'm just reading. Whatever I show you, believe me, it's nothing. You know more than I do. Okay, so I'm going to tell you something. In my lectures, in my lectures, sometimes there are strict moments that people get a little nervous and not comfortable. But I promise you that 99.9% .9 of the strictness of God I hide. I don't show to the people. I don't want to break their spirits. I don't really show them what they are really facing if they continue to live according to the way they live. Why? Like you say, they're going to run away. You know, they say, I'm a lost case anyway. I don't want to hear, forget it. I live seven years here, whatever happened, happened. I have experience of 14 years. I know how people react. But not to show even a drop, it's also not fair. Because a good doctor tells his patient, listen, if you continue what you do, in five years, something will happen to you. Because your heart will not be able to continue. A doctor does not tell it to his patient, he's half murderer. Because because of him, that patient is going to die age 40. If the doctor will tell him, do ABC, he would live to 80. Because of that doctor, he died age 40. You understand? So now the doctor, he could have saved his patients. Not telling him the truth, tell him, take two Advil every day, everything will be fine. It's not going to solve the problem. A good mechanic, when you come to him with a car and the red light check engine is on, and the mechanic said, no problem. He comes, he rips the wire. Now there's no red, wire, red light. The problem is over. That's not a good mechanic. A good mechanic takes care of the problem. The light naturally goes off. A crook rips the wire. A good rabbi cannot tell the people, no worry, just be good people, everything will be fine. It's not fair. He has to read to them exactly what God said. Everybody who come and modify the orders of God is a criminal. Why? Because the Torah says, be very careful not to change my religion, not to add one letter to my book, not to erase one letter from my book. Then you have to be like the Shomroni. They do exactly what God said, and we are all wrongdoing. Okay, first of all, I don't know if most people know what the Shomronims are, but the Shomronims, most of them are not even Jewish. That's one problem. Yeah, but you for, you're forgetting one, one very important thing. The written Torah, it's worthless without the oral Torah. 
You could not make one law from the written Torah without the oral Torah. You want the proof for it? I'll give you two proofs for that. Do you have the question what she says? No. No. She wants to claim that, that you have to stick exactly to the written laws. Whatever the Torah says, you do. And ignore all the oral laws. No, I'm saying you bought a challenge here, so I'm trying to answer it. Here is the point, pay attention. If a, person, if a Jew wants to make a circumcision to his son, what does he read in the Torah? In the eighth day, you have to circumcise every male born. That's all what the Torah says. It's a covenant between me and my nation. That's all. Where does it say where to cut? It just say the word Orla. Nobody knows what Orla is. I claim Orla is here. She say Orla is this. He say Orla is in the nails. He say Orla is the hair. We do not know what the word Orla means. We need the oral Torah to explain us. So right away, nobody knows where to cut. Second, the Torah did not say the written Torah in the day or in the night. It doesn't say it. It did not say what happened if two brothers died, if you're allowed to cut for the third brother, he did not say it. How to cut, how to do it, what tools to use, priya, all these things that the Moel does, there's hundreds of things that relates to it, nobody knows. What happened if the baby is yellow? The Torah did not speak about it. What happened if he was born on Shabbat? Are you allowed to do next Shabbat breed? The Torah says you're not allowed to cut and to bleed on Shabbat. But Brit Milai, everybody knows it's allowed on Shabbat. What happened in Yom Tov? There's hundreds of laws relate to Brit Milah. You do not have one of them in a written Torah. Is it possible that God came and gave the Jewish nation a Torah and he told them you have to circumcise every male born in the eight days and someone who does not do it is out of Judaism. It's called Arel. He cannot, and he never told us where to do it. Is it possible? Obviously not. Then I'll give you another example. The Torah say every Jew has to put filin. Every Jew has to put filin. Where to put filin? The Torah never say. The Torah say Vayale Ot should be a sign on your hand. What is filin? You don't have the word filin in the entire written Torah. Where that filin has to be, you do not know. Left hand or right hand, the Torah does not say. Where on the hand the Torah does not say? How do you make filin? I promise you, you have more than a thousand steps from the time you slaughter the cow until from the skin of the cow you get rid of the air and the entire process to make one pair of filin take one year. It's a thousand steps that if one of them you does incorrectly, it's not a kosher filin. It's worthless. It's true. It's nothing. So, and inside what you write, all the letters in the right order, what happens if one letter touch the other, there's thousands of laws related to that filin. If one of them you did incorrectly, that filin is worthless. Where is all these laws in the written Torah? Now, not that many people know that the oral Torah was given before the written Torah. Before they received the oral Torah, the written Torah, Moshe already told them how to do the mitzvot. So why is that written? Oh, now this gentleman asking why God did not write everything in one book and finish. The answer is, if all the laws would be in one book, the Goyim will become Jews as us without coming to us. They go in their nation, they have a book, they copy it, they do everything we do. They have a beer, they have peor, they have yamaka, they have tzitzit, they circumcise, they learn Hebrew. So what to, wait, 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 wait. Three generations later, what happened? You do not know who your son is going to marry. Comes uh, Sarah, but she's really Christine. Her mother is not Jewish, she's not Jewish, she has a different soul. She comes to marry you, one of the laws in the Torah, that the Jews are not allowed to marry the non-Jews. But if she comes with covering her hair, and she's praying Tehillim all day, and she's a Goya, you do not know. That's by the way, what's, the that's by the way what's happening right the now in Israel. Yeah, what's the what's happening yeah. right now in Israel, you have 800,000 Russians that came to Israel. Almost all of them are not Jewish. So now they go to Hebrew school. Next generation, their children is going, but they marry the Jews. And that's the end of the nation of Israel.
with that. No. Okay. Your She's answers not... are very detailed and very well uh, calculated yeah, and chosen. very nice. Yeah. Very well chosen. But yeah. you're saying if, if everybody copies the same loss yeah. and they have the same loss, yeah. everybody uh, abided by the same loss. Yeah. So it won't be due. Okay, I'm, answer, I'm answering it. You're asking yes. the same question. Yes. She asked, what is the what's wrong is it the blood if the Jews, if the non-Jews will do exactly what the Jews do and wants to be like us? What's wrong? Mm -hmm. The answer is, the Torah says, do not marry the non-Jews. <coughs> you have to separate from them. Don't behave like them. Don't look like them. Don't eat their food. Don't call yourself their names. Don't give your son to their daughters. Don't give your daughter to their son because I'm sick and tired of all the things that they did in front of me and I'm not interested, you intermarry with them. And another place in the Torah it says, you are the chosen people. I chose you from all the nations to be my children. Do not marry any other nation because I'm holy and I made you holy. Now I want to ask you with all the respect, if we ask your opinion, and my opinion, in this case, I'm in your side, two human beings, with our intelligence, why not to take a non-Jewish girl for our son? Why not? She's a very nice girl. Not she cooks, wait, wait, she cooks, she's intelligent, she's very rich, she's very pretty, she has a heart of gold, but the, her only crime is that her mother is Christian, she's not Jewish. That's her only crime. Why, why to discriminate against her? and not let her join our family and live like us like she wants. Why? The answer is because the creator of the world decided that it's not permitted. And you and I and everybody else with all the respect cannot come and tell him, be quiet, we know better. That's all. That's the answer. Why it's so hard to understand? I'm dying to marry my son to this mother. I'm dying. But God told me you're not allowed. What can I do? God told me you should not steal. I'm dying to steal. I have five diamonds right here on the floor. Nobody looks. I pick it up. I don't have to, to walk for the rest of the night. I'm dying to steal it. But God told me don't steal. I'll punish you for that. So it's like everything else. Why, why, why? The answer is because God says so. That's all. Didn't God create everybody, all the human beings the same? No. It's just because of what we read. I have news for you. Different. Even among the Jews, not everyone is the same. You want to know? I don't okay. Know. First of all, Cohen. We are all Cohen God's is, creation. Nahon. You're Cohen. Right. Yes. Cohen is higher than Levi. <laughs> You're right. You're right. I keep on telling her. She doesn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to respect her. Baba, <laughs> <laughs> just talk about that session. The rest of the night is clean. Baba, it's in the quiet. <laughs> I didn't. Thank you very much. I did not show one proof yet. Just keep in mind, I have more than a hundred, but I'll show Don't only two. <laughs> okay. Shh. Now, Cohen is higher than Levi and Israelite. Levi is higher than Israelite, but less than Cohen. Israelite, Israel, it's less than Cohen and Levi. Men and women, men is better in certain things, and women is better in different things. A, a bastard, what's his, a, a mamzer, was married from a, a married woman that cheated on her husband and she became pregnant from another man. This person called a bastard. What is his crime? He did not do anything. The Torah says he's a second class citizen. Someone who is a slave, he became a slave. He did not pay his loans. They sold him to be a slave. He has less rights than other people. So you see that God raided people in different levels. Now I want to tell you. you believe them? Uh, the Torah said God I didn't make it. God does not judge if God is Shh, if wait, God wait, is wait. The wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I want to tell God you something. Is just. I want to tell Why you. Would he Sixty know? years ago, there was a person called Adolf Hitler. He came with his intelligence and decided that Jews are less than Aries, the Germans. Blacks are less. Homosexuals are less. He got to a point that he decided that to get rid of the Jews, the homosexuals and the blacks is a mitzvah. And that's what he did to a certain extent. Now, if I come here tonight 
and I give my speech, and I say, you are better than her, and she is better than her, and he is better than all of you, and that's based on my intelligence, I'm nothing better than Hitler. Why? Who am I to decide what person is better than the other? You're right. But when I open the book of God, that the Christians admit is the word of God, get, don't get me wrong, the Muslims admitted it's the word of God. <laughs> to admit that it's the word of God, whether you're ignorant or not, it's a fact. Oh, no, no, no. Wait, 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 let me finish. So now, if God... the Torah, we are ignorant. Oh, now... we follow Judaism with ignorance. Okay, now I... the difference between us and the Muslims? Now I have another news for you. The Torah says, Whoever understands Hebrew will confirm that I translated correct. If you follow my laws, and you keep my mitzvot, and you really do it, not just in heart, you really do it, you will become a special nation. But if you don't keep my laws, you're nothing better than the goyim. That's what the Torah says. Now I have news for you. The Jews that ignore the Torah and don't keep Shabbat and don't do what the Torah says, they're exactly in a state like a regular Gentile. Actually, it's worse. Why? A non-Jew has to keep only seven laws. That's all. Seven laws. Who gave the non-Jew seven laws? The Torah. When Noah came out of the ark, there was eight people in the world. God gave him seven laws to keep. Once, the world restarted with eight people. In 900 years later, the Jews received the Torah. From the time of the flood until the Jews received the Torah, all the people in the world were equal. They all had to keep only seven laws. That's it. There was no Torah yet. Once the Jews received the Torah, the Jews received 613 laws. So that means the Jews received 606 extra laws, but the non-Jews did not receive them. Now, according to the effort, that's how much the reward is going to be. The Torah promise, if you become righteous and you follow my laws, I am faithful to keep my promise and reward my lovers who keep my mitzvot. This is word by word from the written Torah. For thousands of generations, uh, we only live one generation here, I will reward my lovers who keep my mitzvot for thousands of generations. What's the rest of the sentence? And I paid, and I pay my enemies who do not keep my mitzvot cash to their face to get rid of them. It's a sentence in the Torah. I will say it in Hebrew. Meshalem le'ohavai לשומרי מצוותיי לאלף דור ולא משלם לשונאי אל פניו לעבידו I'm paying to my haters, to those who do not keep the mitzvot cash to their face, I give them everything they dream about to get rid of them and the rest of the sentence לא אאחר לשונאו I will not delay the reward to those who rebel against me I will pay them right now to finish what I owe them. I don't want to owe them later on anything. So what we see, that a person that has successful life and achieve his goals and he goes against the laws of God, it's a very bad sign. If a person, there's no contradiction of being righteous and being a billionaire. We have many Hasidic billionaires, they own chains, buildings in Manhattan, diamonds. You can live according to the Torah and be very successful in business. Nowhere ever the Torah said that because you chose to be religious, you are limited and you cannot be a millionaire. It's not true. Abraham was a millionaire. Yitzhak was a millionaire. Yaakov was a millionaire. David Amelech eventually was a millionaire. Rabbi Akiva became a billionaire. Rabbi Tarfon was a billionaire. Read the history. Most of the famous names in Judaism were very rich. They were in businesses, they have motels, hotels, property, thousands of camels and sheep. Where is the contradiction? I don't know why some people in this generation think that if a person chooses to keep Shabbat, 
and to not to be a thief, and not to charge interest from another Jew, and not to cheat on his wife, and all these things, he's going to suffer in this life. It's not true. You can live according to the Torah in a fantastic life. Success in a family, love between the children, the children will give respect to the parents, they're going to bring a good wife to the house, they're going to have great grandchildren, they're not going to touch drugs, they're going to have a much healthier life. And they can still live in a fancy house and have great uh, business. It's some kind of misunderstanding that people think, if my son will be religious, that means he's not going to achieve my goals. No, I don't know where it came from. It's not true at all. Yes. So it's religion to what extent? Family, to what extent? To the extent of the creator of the world, what the Torah that's, says. That's very far. That's, if you want to be that far, how could you be focused on other things? I want to ask you a question. I just gave an example. I can give you a name, a list, from the people I know. Hundreds of, of Jews that keep the Torah 100%, sit and learn every day, come three times to show, all these things they do, and they're very successful in their businesses. It never got them to lose a penny, if any, they had very big success in their businesses. And they donate tons of money to yeshivot, to places, to orphans, to widows. They deliver thousands of boxes of food every Shabbat to people, to families. And the, the more they give, the more they make. That's one way. Now, I want to tell you something. Not you and not I are capable to make a decision what's the right way. The Torah says, Vasita ayashar ve'atov be'ene Hashem elokecha. You have to do what right and decent in the eyes of your God, not in your eyes. According to your opinions, uh, for instance, I'm just giving an example, it's better not to do anything. Let's say, to take money from the government. According to her opinion, it's better to be a crook. According to my opinion, it's better not to work. According to her opinion, it's better to work 20 hours a day. According to his opinion, is uh, I don't know, everyone has a different opinions. Who is going to decide who is right? Does people can decide who has the right opinion, what's the right way? Of course not. We all were created equal. We have all kinds of uh, uh, opinions. We cannot go by what we think. If we go by what we think, in that case, what do you want from Hitler? That was his truth. He was successful to achieve his truth. What do you want from Ahmadinejad that wants to throw an atomic bomb in Israel? That's his truth. What do you want from whatever? We are not deciding what's true and what's not. Whether we like it, whether we don't like it, we have to follow what the text orders us. You understand? And if the Torah told me, don't be a thief, whether I want it, whether I don't want it, it's irrelevant. If the Torah told me you have to pray every day, don't be ungrateful to your Creator that gives you food and oxygen and everything you have comes from Him, then I have to teach myself not to be an ungrateful person. If the Torah told me don't look at not mother's ladies on the street because later you cannot look at your own wife, and that's going to be your divorce later on, or cheating on her. Why? Because you don't watch your eyes. I have to discipline myself not to enjoy other ladies' body. Whether I like it or not, I'm a man also. And may, I may like her, she's very pretty. But God told me, don't look at her. You want to love your wife forever? Don't look at her. Don't look at magazines. Don't look at dirty movies. Show your children the right way. The Torah gave me a guideline. Some of the things the Torah told me, I understand perfectly. Some of the things the Torah told me, I don't understand at all. I'll give you an example. If I made a sin in Shabbat by mistake, in the time of the Holy Temple, I had to take a goat all the way to Jerusalem and sacrifice the goat and cry and say, forgive me for what I did. Do I understand such a thing? What do you want from the goat? Punish me! What do you want from him? That's divine logic. He knows all the secrets of the creation. Just by the way, to give you an idea, this God was a person like me and you in his previous life. The soul was reincarnated in his body, and from Shammai, God chose that animal to be sacrificed as a repentance for his, punish, for his sins, for his previous life. It's Kabbalah. Leave it aside now. A normal person sees that we're killing animals every day. What's the logic? No logic. Divine logic. No human logic. 80% of Judaism, it's against human logic. I'll give you an example. Where is the logic to make your house clean from breadcrumbs for seven days? Who cares? Who cares? God cares. Why? 
It's his opinion, I don't know. I'll give you another example. There's a mitzvah, if you walk in the street one day, and you see a nest of a bird. You see a bird. Bird with the chicks or the eggs inside the nest. The Torah says, get rid of the mother, send the mother away, take the eggs, put it somewhere, you're going to inherit long life. It's a big mitzvah. Do you understand this mitzvah? Do you understand that or not? No. no. If you come and say it to your professor in Harvard, what is he going to say? Oh, these Jews are crazy. They're crazy. Don't stand next to me. You cruel nation. I don't want to be next to you. That's what he's going to say. That's what he's going to say. Who cares what he says? I know that I have a divine book in my hand. The fact that I don't understand my creator make my religion special. All the other 80,000 religions, it's all perfectly understood. Sorry. Why? Because people like me and you wrote the laws. And when they wrote the, the laws, they made it for people like me and you. But God is above humanity. We do not understand this thinking. The Torah says, don't try to analyze me in a human brain. Excuse me. My thoughts... And your thoughts are not the same. So if My way is... Even if you don't understand... 100%. If somebody asks you, why do we have to do this mitzvah? Why do we have to do this mitzvah? Why do we have to do this mitzvah? I can give you a 10-hour speech why each mitzvah was given to us. But you know what's the truth? The truth is because this is the way God wanted it and we don't understand it. That's the right answer. And we shouldn't try to understand We it. try to understand. That's what the whole Gemara is all about. Question, answer. Question, answer. But we will never know 1% of the brilliance of God. Who wrote the oral Torah? Good question. Yes. After many years, you know that I changed the entire lecture, you know. I'm sorry. All right, no problem. I'd rather answer your question, but I also want to show two, three proofs for those who have doubts about the oral Torah. I want to show, I have proofs here that leaves no doubt that the oral Torah was given by the creator of the world. No human being could give such a book. No book. So the written Torah and the oral, and the oral Torah, Torah are by the creator. Okay, now, for those who did not know, for those who did not know, the Torah says, those are, those are the Torahs, plural, and the laws, and the boards of stones that I put in the hand of Moshe in Mount Sinai. Those are the Torahs, plural, not Torah. Torahs, it's minimum two, right? Torahs. Which Torah? The written and the oral. Now, as I explained you, there is no way to make one mitzvah in a Torah without checking the oral laws. Nobody knows how to make matzah without Moshe showing the first people how to do it. Nobody would know how to slaughter an animal without Moshe for the first time when he came down from the mountain show us all the things that the written Torah does not say. Nobody know how to circumcise a baby. Nobody know how to keep Shabbat, all these laws. Everything is oral. Once Moshe gave it, he taught the nation for a period of 40 years. He taught them how to do it orally. And from that moment, it passed from father to son. I'll give you an example. Let's look at the Christians. The Christian has a Christmas holiday every year. Every year they put a tree. And they have once a year Thanksgiving. They eat turkey, right? Today, they don't need that to write in a book that you have to eat turkey every year. You don't need it. It's, goes, okay, it's orally. Orally. You saw your father doing it, you're doing it. Your son's going to do it. His son, thousands of years, Every American guy will eat turkey on Thanksgiving. Why? Because this is the way he brought up. Me and you, we saw our parents eating matzah on Pesach without even knowing the Torah. We will do the same thing because this is the way he brought up. Now remember, we have the laws written, but everything passed from father to son. Give me just five minutes. I want to show at least one proof. I'm going to skip some, but I want to show what I mean when I say proof. I'm going to show you proof from the oral Torah to give you an idea what I mean written and oral Torah. Here. The Torah, this is the written Torah. The re and this is the oral. Who wrote the, the, the oral Torah? Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, 2,000 years ago. For 1,300 years, 
It was written on scrolls, separately. For instance, the laws of Pesach on a separate scroll. The laws of circumcision on a separate scroll. The laws of Shabbat on a separate But it was forbidden to put everything together to make sure that the Goim will not have it. If they have it, it's the end of the world. Why? You will never know who is a Jew and who is not. Because everybody wanted to, be, belong, to belong to the nation of God. Remember, he was fresh. The whole world was shaking when God gave 50 million Jews the Torah in Mount Sinai. Right away they translated this book to 70 languages. If they had everything in the, in the text, you would not know even if me and you are Jewish. I wouldn't be here. Why should I waste my time if I don't even know if I'm Jewish or not? Maybe my grand-grand-grandparents were imitators. So the Torah didn't want it. The Torah wanted to keep the Jews separate from all the nation. One way to do it is to hide the oral laws from the non-Jews. That even if they want to keep Shabbat, they'll never know how. You understand? That's what she gave. I don't know where she is. But she gave us an example about the Shomronim. Shomronim is a group of Goim that do exactly what the written Torah do. For instance, when they put tzitzit, they hang it on a wall. Why? Because the Torah says, the written Torah says, and you should see it. And they say, where do you see it? On the wall. But they didn't have the oral laws. The oral law says that it must be around the body. Two from the front, two from the back. And it has to be in four corners. They didn't have these parts. So whatever they do, it's worthless. Why? Because it's not according to the divine law. So I'll give you an example. The Torah says, every Jew is allowed to eat sushi. <laughs> the Torah said, this is what you're allowed to eat from everything that lives in the water. Which water? It did not say. That means all the water in the world. 72% of the world is water. Everything that has fins and scales, a Jew is allowed to eat. So therefore, a shark is not kosher. A shark has fins, but it doesn't have any scales. Dolphin, it's not kosher. Swordfish, it's not kosher. Tuna fish, it's kosher. Salmon is kosher. How do we know? Very simple. We don't have to recognize the fish. There's more than 40,000 different kinds of fish. All we have to do, somebody just gave me a fish in a store in Chinatown. Oh, it has fins, it has scales. What's the name of the fish? Who cares? It has fins and scales? I'm allowed to eat it. Let's bring it to the Shabbos table. No problem. Comes the oral law. Now remember, the Torah did not speak about fish. Everything that lives in the ocean. The Torah say, this is what you are allowed to eat from the water. Everything that has fins and scales, you can eat. Comes the oral Torah, seven words. I wish you would be here. She's right there. Yeah, don't miss that part. Okay. Everything... 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 I thought goose it's meat, no? No? Goose is cooking. Listen. Ah, okay. I thought it's meat. To no, no, no. I told them to listen. Okay. Everything that has seven words that proves without any doubt that the oral Torah could never be given by a person, only by the creator of the world. Seven words, that's all. Everything that has scales must have fins. Divine law. Everything that you're going to catch from the ocean forever, if you saw in the body of it scales, I promise you, you will also see fins. Why? I made it, I know. Now remember. All, no, I don't talk about fish. Everything you grab oh, from, the, from the water. If you saw scales in the body that you scratch them and they fall, must have fins. If we are going to find one thing from the oceans ever, one, not two, one. That, for instance, a snake. If we found a snake with scales, that you scratch it and the scales are falling from his body, it's the end of Judaism, you put the Torah in the toilet paper, in the toilet, in the bathroom and flush. No problem. Why? It's not divine. Why? One mistake, it's all over. We are not Christians that have in every page ten mistakes, or Muslims. No mistakes in Judaism whatsoever. This is all oral laws. Oral. Oral Torah. Not the rabbis. The rabbis don't know such a thing. No rabbi in the world, no, 72% of the world simultaneously, he can see all the trillions of things that are moving in the ocean and tell you there's not even one like this. 
Nobody can swear that there is not a particular thing in the world. For instance, if, I, if you come and tell me, uh, I can swear that there's no person in the world with two heads. Most likely you're right, but you cannot swear on your life. There is. Why? One to a billion, maybe there's one, right? Uh, to prove something does not exist, it's impossible. To prove that something exists, it's possible. You bring it and it's over. Here it is, it exists. To prove that it does not exist, it's impossible. To say such a thing, it's a huge risk. Because all you need is one guy that caught something like this one day in the ocean and say, hey, scales, no fins, end of Torah. Finish, it's all over. No Shabbat, no Tfilin, no Brit, no Yom Kippur. It's all garbage from this moment on. Why? Because we found the first mistake. Understand? So now remember. In order to write such a thing, first of all remember that half of the things that live today in the oceans were not even exist when the Torah was given to the Jews. Because they all create new species all the time. They mix. Scientists in Florida, in Elat, in all kinds of places, always artificially create new species. And when the Torah was written, the Torah promised everything you ever find for all the generations will never have scales without fins. Always together. Is it written at the same time? Oral and written at the same time? The oral was given to Moshe Rabbeinu at the same time in Mount Sinai. It was written later on. But it was passing from father to son, from rabbi to student, every day for 1,300 years all over the nation. Now, in order for us to write such a thing, a person has to see simultaneously all the oceans and see that this thing does not exist. He has to know the internal, the internal and the external way of all these species. He has to foresee all the future until the end of the world. He has to know all the scientists, what are they going to do. He has to know all the artificial and natural merge of all the fish together to promise that something like this will never be exist. Who's going to take such a risk? What rabbi will gain anything by writing such a thing? What is he gaining by that? To prove what? That he's a prophet? That he knows the future? How? How does he know? How can he see all the oceans? How can he swear that there's never going to be even one snake with scale? What does it have to do with religion? Nothing. You know what's the reason that the Torah told us that? That today, you and her and me, when we have doubts about the oral Torah, we will use our common sense. I have more than 500 examples like this, here, in this lecture and in other lectures that I have, that shows that the oral Torah could never, ever be written by a human being. Never! I'll give you another example. Every kosher animal, all the meat we ate today, how do you know it's kosher or not? You go, you, they buy cows from Argentina, from Uruguay, from all these places. They slaughter the cow. They have many things that they check. Some of them they put to the Arabs, halal. Halal, it's all the leftover from the non-kosher meat that was slaughtered. The Christians don't need to slaughter. The Christian takes 1,000 cows. They put them on a special electric floor. One guy press the button. They electrocute the 1,000 cows and they fall. One Jew one told me, you, the religious people, eat the meat so dry. The non, the non kosher meat ah, is so juicy. You, yeah. you eat it, you suck the, the liquid from the steak. So I told them, you fool. Your ignorance will cost you big time. Why? Why you like the steak? You know why? Because when you kill a cow, when you shoot it in the head, or when you electrocute the cow, the cow falls on the floor for a few hours until they get to it. There's thousands. What happened to the cow? The cow is full of buckets of blood and pee inside the stomach. All the pee that the cow is supposed to go to the bathroom, it's much more than a human being. It's 20, 30 bottles of cork full of pee inside the stomach of the cow. When the Jews slaughter the cow and they butcher it and they open it to two halves, what's the first thing the Jews do? They take tons of salt and throw all over the cow. Why? The soul gets all the water and the liquid out of the veins, out of the body, right into the garbage. All the pee and the germs and all the dirt of the cow goes out 
within 72 hours. Remember, in a butcher store, you're gonna see soak and salted within 72 hours. Why? Because after 72 hours, you can put as much salt as you want. It's not gonna help. It's absorbed in the internal parts of the animal. When they eat non-kosher meat, they're actually sucking the pee of the cow. Yeah. And they enjoy it so much. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I give you another example. One guy in Switzerland, one prosecutor, one prosecutor in Switzerland, he decided that the way the Jews slaughter the animals is very cool. He said, don't, we don't want to allow any more kosher slaughtering. Why? Because the animals have two cords that bring the blood into the brain in the front, but they have two cords reserved in the back. So when the Jews slaughter the neck, they only cut the front. But the animals continue to get blood for another five, ten minutes, and the animals suffering tremendous pain. The Jews slaughtering, the Jewish slaughtering is very cruel. They took it to court in Switzerland. The judge decided no more kosher meat in Switzerland. It's true. Came the rabbis to appeal. The rabbis say, Your Honor, with all the respect, you never knew one thing when you made that decision. When the creator of the world gave us, the chosen people, the Torah, he told us how to slaughter the animal. And he told us there is a list of animals that are allowed, permitted to Jews to eat. And most of the animals, there are more than two million different kinds of animals. Almost all of them is not kosher. Maybe 20, 30 are kosher. And all the rest are not kosher. So now, you're right. When you cut the neck of the horse, the horse has two cords in the back. When you slaughter the neck of the pig, the pig has two cords in the back. Many other animals, you're right. But check carefully. Look at the list of all the animals that the Torah allowed the Jews to eat. If you find one of them that have two reserve cords in the back, forbid all the Jewish slaughtering forever. But you will never find. Because all the list of the kosher animals in the Torah have only two cords in the front, nothing in the back. As soon as you, pay, you take the knife and you go like this, in less than a second, the animal does not feel any pain. So why the animal is still shaking? Reflex. No pain whatsoever. The judge was shot. They put it, they put it back. It's kosher again. Why? Ignorance. They didn't know that the creator of the world knows how to kill the animals in the best way. When you kill a horse, you're right. You slaughter a horse, the horse continues to suffer. But when you kill a goat, he has only two. Cow, only two. An ox, only two. Even a giraffe, it's kosher. Only two in the front. Deer, it's kosher. What do you see? A divine knowledge. I will give one more proof and we'll finish. One more proof. Relates to the animals. If we are in this field, the Torah says, every animal that has two wings, Every animal that has two signs, two signs, it's kosher. If it doesn't have two signs, it's not kosher. What are the two signs to know if an animal is kosher or not? It needs to have split hooves and chew his cud. Re-digest the food. It comes out of the stomach and they swallow it again. Two signs. Comes the Torah and say, my dear Jewish son, don't be fooled by four animals that may fool you. From two million animals that we know today, there are four exceptional animals. Only four. The pig, the camel, the rabbit, and the hare, which looks like a rabbit. Four animals only. What's special about these animals? They have only one sign. Either they have split hooves, or chew its cut, but not both of them. You may be fooled by them and think they're kosher. No. They have only one sign. Why do I tell you this story? Very simple. Why? If one person will be able to bring the fifth animal. Here is another one. The Torah did not say it. He brings one animal one day and says, See, 
This animal has split hooves, but it doesn't chew its cut. That will be the end of the Torah. What human being knows two million different kinds of animals? If you live 7,000 years, you're still not going to finish to check two million different kinds of animals. Plus, there is always mixture between all the species, as we all know. The Torah was given 3,319 years ago, and the Torah promised for all the animals all over the world, there is only four that I made with one sign. <clears throat> if we will find five, it will be over Judaism. Why? It's not divine. How God didn't know? God wrote four. Here we go, we have six. We have ten. That's a mistake in the Torah. Everything will be over. Everything will be over. What religion has such nonsense? But what? This knowledge, this knowledge that we have in the Torah, it's all 100% divine. So the next time when you come and say to your son, the rabbis made it, hold your words. First go and check, and I promise you, from the bottom of my heart, everything you're going to say, the rabbis made it, you will be wrong. You will be wrong 100%. I used to say it myself also. And today I know everything I ever thought it was all wrong. Why? Not because you're bad people. Not because you're not smart in what you do. Not because you're not intelligent. It's nothing to do one with the other. You just never learn enough Torah. If you learn Torah, you would see that just everything you think about the tradition is wrong. We are wrong, not the Torah. I will finish. What was that, 23? 23 is the ankle, is the, is the, the ankle, the angle of the earth. The earth is turning around, but it's not straight. It's a little bit crooked. It's 23 degrees crooked. The earth is turning around in 1,700 kilometer an hour, 11 miles an hour. And that's what gives us 24 hours in every day. So. I have, uh, I have many, many proofs, but I'm skipping a lot. I just want to show the last one, which I told you. This is, by the way, the way it is. <coughs> this is the sun, this is the earth, and this is the moon, the white one, right? <laughs> so now the earth is turning around the sun every year. It finishes in an entire circle. But it's always turning around itself. You see, this is Israel now, the green point. Now it's America. <laughs> now it's Israel. Now it's America. Every 12 hours, approximately, we go towards the sun and towards the other side. And that's what day and night is. And this is the moon that turns around the earth. So sometimes the moon is between the earth and the sun. It becomes dark in the middle of the day. That's called an eclipse. Okay? But this is what I wanted to show you. <laughs> Not this. <laughs> How many stars we have in the world? How many was? Stars. Trillions. Trillions. Quarter trillions. Ten to the power of 19 stars. That's what the scientist says. One and 18 digits after. Very large number. But not, not many people know that until 400 years ago, in the generation of Galileo Galilei, the whole world was sure 100% that there's no more than 8,000 stars. Why? People were standing on mountains and counting the stars like this. There was no telescope. So they're counting the stars and they came between six to 8,000. That was their figure. One day Galileo Galilei developed a telescope six feet wide and he rises it to the sky. For the first time in the world in history, people realized that just everything we thought about the star was far away from the truth. Now we just realized there are many, many galaxies that we cannot see without the telescope. And the world realized that there's much more than 8,000 stars. I want to read to you a part from the oral Torah, from the Gemara. The Gemara was written approximately 2,000 years ago in Babylon, in Babel, in Iraq, right next door to Iran. And and this is what the Gemara say. The nation of Israel came to God and asked him a question. Dear God, a person gets remarried. He will never forget his ex-wife. 
What's the analogy here? How did you forget about us? Completely. That's, this conversation is after the destruction of the second temple. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians 2600 years ago. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans 2000 years ago. The Jews lost hope. The Goim took us and threw us out of the land. 2000 years ago the temple was destroyed. There was big depression. The Knesset of Israel, the Chachamim, the 120 chief rabbis and prophets, they wrote that they had a discussion with God. What is this? It's metaphor, you know. They wrote a part of the oral Torah that God gave Moshe in Mount Sinai. What is it? The number of the stars in the universe. And God told the nation of Israel, my daughter, I'm reading right from here. Twelve section I created in heaven. This is where the horoscope coming from, the twelve signs. Each sign comes for a section. If you have a circle, a circle of 360 degrees. If you divide it to twelve equal slices, each slice will be 30 degrees. Every time the earth, when the earth goes around the sun, Every time the earth goes to that 30 degrees, it's one sign. When it continues to travel and it goes to the next slice, it's another sign. And another sign. And another sign until it finishes the entire year. That's how it works. The Torah says, 12 sections I created in heaven. In each section I created 30 armies. In each army I created 30 legion. In each legion I created 30 raton. In each raton I created 30 karaton. In each karaton I created 30 gistera. In each gistera I hung 365,000 multiplied by 10,000 stars. And all of that I created for you. Who is you? The nation of Israel. And you have the nerve to tell me that I left you and forgot about you. What am I reading you all these stories? Yeah. I hope you're catching the point here. <coughs> this is a billion dollar slide, if you smile. Pay attention to what's going on here. Twelve sections I created in heaven. In each one I created 30, so 12 times 30, times 30, times 30, 30, 30, times 365, times 10,000. This is the exact number of stars that God created when he created his world. Now, what the scientists have to tell us about this? Here you go. In 1990, Dr. T. Bruhels from Queen Mary College in London had a research with the help of mega computers and he found that there are 10 to the power of 19 stars in the universe. We don't care what he found, if it's 10 to the power of 19 or 18 or 20 or 21, it doesn't really matter because anyway they estimate. What we care is one thing. Who, what human being, 2,000 years in Babylon or when we receive it 3,300 years in Mount Sinai, what human being by looking at the sky and see maximum 8,000 stars would even dream that there's such a number of stars? If he would dare to say it, they put him in a mental house for the rest of his life. Are you crazy? Where are you getting all this nonsense? The Jews always right. Why? Not because they are great scientists. They just got it from God as a gift. He gave us the Torah. Torah in Hebrew means instruction. Torah or Ra'ah. We have all the secrets in the creation and the written and the oral Torah. Not that we're such a great scientist, we had to make all these researches and count. If NASA only knew the things the Torah say, it would save them billions of dollars. So, the interesting part is that the scientists also share it to seven different categories. The scientists, without knowing Torah, they just use different names, galactic area, local galaxies, Galaxies, a, galaxy, a, a group of galaxies, group of multiple and glo global, global uh, groups, they have all kinds of scientists' names. But the bottom line is what we call stars, they also call stars. So this is the seven sections according to science. 
And this is the seventh section according to the Gemara. Who cares what the names are? It's the exact same thing. The question is, for those who have doubt, the Gemara is from the rabbis, the Gemara is from God, I hope that answers your doubts. It leaves no doubt. And if you still have a doubt, speaking about this, the renewal of the moon. Do you know the renewal of the moon? Did you ever hear the exact renewal of the moon? How long does it take for the moon to renew itself? In Judaism, we are celebrating Passover always on the spring. Why? Because the Torah say, Chag Aviv, the holiday of the spring. But we have a very serious problem. Why? Because Judaism goes by the year of the sun and the year of the moon. The Muslims, they only go by the year of the moon. So the year of the moon is 354 days. The year of the sun is 365 days. It's 11 days gap. 11 days different between the sun and the moon. Every three years, the holiday should move by a month. Why every year it moves 11 days? So after three years, Passover should move from the spring towards the winter. And then another three years, it moves even more towards the winter. And that's going to be the first lie in the Torah. Because the Torah called Pesach, the holiday of the spring. It must be on the spring. How are we going to solve the problem? The Christians, they go only by the sun. So every four years, they have February 29. Why? To make it balance. The Jews that go by the sun and the moon have a serious problem. And this is what the oral Torah tells us. It leaves no doubt that only God could say such a thing. At that time, God told Moshe the laws and the calculation of the moon and inform him how he's going to make a leap here and how he decide the Rosh Chodesh, the month, because the Torah say keep the holiday of the spring and make Pesach then. Now, every 19 years cycle, the Jews push seven extra months into the calendar. What is it? Adar Aleph, Adar Bet. Every two to three years, depend, we have an extra month in a, in a year, 13 months. Every 19 years, the Jew, Jewish and the Christian dates fall on the same day. On the same day, every 19 years. Every 19 years, it's a cycle. How did Moshe know to do it? Because God told him, make sure. Every time you see Pesach is moving a little bit towards the winter, you're going to push another man to delay it by another four weeks. You must keep it in the spring. How do you do it? You're not going to believe what you're going to see. Now, in the old days, there was no calendar. How did they know when is the first day of the, of the month? Two witnesses that saw the renewal of the moon ran to the Jewish court, to the base din, and told the rabbis over there, I just saw the renewal of the moon. And the rabbis was announcing, today it's Rosh Chodesh. And they begin to count how many days until Pesach. 14 days, and in the 15 days, Pesach. Or Yom Kippur, 10 days from Tishrei. That's how it was. It was very primitive. Something unbelievable. One day, 200 witnesses came to Rabban Gamliel, the president of Israel. Rabbi, we just saw the renewal of the moon. Rabbi Gamliel told them, it's in the Gemara, you can see the source in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 25. It's impossible. You all wrong. The Torah say, two kosher witnesses, you have to accept their testimony. He had 200, <laughs> not two, 200. It was a cloudy day. He told them, you all wrong. How did he know? He say, we have information that we received in Mount Sinai that travel from generation to generation. This was 1,300 years later, after the, after the Torah was passing orally from father to son. I'm just finishing, I promise. Two more minutes and we finish. So, the Torah was transferred from one hand to another until his generation. And this is what he said. Amar lahem Rabban Gamliel. This is the way we accept it throughout the generation. The renewal of the moon can never be less than 29 days and a half and two-thirds of the hour 
and 73 parts of the minute. 29 days, everybody know what it is. And a half, it's 12 hours. And two thirds of the other hour, it's 40 minutes. And 73 of the parts of the minute, it gives us 29.530590000. That's the minimum. The renewal of the moon will never ever be less than this. We are talking to the 10,000th of a second. Take a second, share it to 10,000 pieces, one second. And this is how exact is the number of the Gemara. Let's see what the scientists have to say. In front of you, you have an original copy of NASA. Earth, Moon, System. This is the number they came. The Torah say 29.530590. The scientists in NASA, the scientists in NASA say 29.530588. After they invested billions of dollars and more than 30 years of measurements and research, mega computers, satellites, all the things, they came with this number. The Gemara, the primitive Gemara of the rabbis, they gave us 29.530590. The Germans are a little bit more precise than the Americans. This is an original copy, 1965 in Berlin. The German came 29.530589. And it's one ten thousandth of the second difference than the number the oral Torah gave and the number of a research of many, many years and many billions of dollars. I want to conclude. Any human being would dream 2,000 or 3,000 years to give you the moon will never be renewed. Less than 29.530590000. When we did not even have calculator. Forget about computer and satellite. We didn't even have calculator. The computer, this computer, this laptop, cannot calculate to 10,000 of a second. Cannot. You need a very serious computer for that. How do you think that the rabbis made up the oral Torah? The rabbis could never made it. They only receive it and transfer it from, and the same Gemara and the same Torah told you the laws of Shabbat. And they told us all the laws of Judaism. The fact that we do not learn and we do not practice, will hurt us. Nobody else is responsible for what he does. We have to report in the end of our life what we did right and what we did wrong. Now, those who do not learn and do not know what to do, they have to ask. I encourage every one of you, I have in my website more than 300 lectures. More than 300. This lecture, just to give you an idea, I only show you three or four slides. I have more than extra hundred slides in this lecture which I didn't even get to. More. By the way, I, I want to tell you something. I said when I was in, I have a world record. I want to break about it. I have the world record. If somebody ever asks you what was the longest lecture in the history of this creation, it was mine. For sure. How many hours? How many hours? Started at 8 o'clock in Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn about seven years ago to 7.30 in the morning, not one person left. People were sitting on the floor, there was not enough chair. 12 hours, everybody that night became religious. They put 12 in hours, place. they went to camp. How many stayed awake? Huh? <laughs> everybody was awake. They didn't even start. <laughs> one guy said, give us two minutes for cigarette. Two minutes for cigarette. I said, we, we have a lot to go with on that side. Going back to your question, yeah. what is the purpose of that? Oh. What was the purpose? I'm afraid that you say I kept you here all night, you know. Okay. They don't have little kids. She right? asked about the purpose of life. Okay, let's start with you, because the answer to her is a little bit long. No, what? what? No, I'm attending your conversation. Please come here, Mr. Alexander. I can't hear you. Mr. Cohen, come over. Rabbi, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. I've been taking notes because I enjoyed your lectures. I attended. God knows I find you educational and entertaining as well. Uh, but 
you know, if I want to go, my one question consists of a whole bunch of other questions that if we want to attend all of them, perhaps till 8 o'clock tomorrow won't be enough. But I want to limit it to the first a few. And one is that, it, first of all, why did God choose the 0.2% of all the population as opposed to other 99.8%? Why there's only few Jews? That's the question. No. Why, why only two? Why one or two? Did God chose. He's saying that we are the chosen. Ah, okay, okay. Why did God chose only three percent of a percent of all the population that He created? Okay. He created all of us. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Why did He chose us as the chosen ones? I heard that. What's the next question? The question is that if we, if we have the wisdom that has the whole. Torah and everything, why is it that we, we seem like we're preventing the other 99.8% to gain that knowledge? Thank they you. Don't. Thank you. This oh, is very important. The answer to your question is like this. I got it. I got it. Why are they chosen to be Cohen? I got it. Because they are the family of Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. That's all. Please make sure. Why one kid born to rich no. kids, and parents, and one kid I born heard, to non-rich right. parents? I heard somewhere Same that the DNA is different than us. Yes, yes. 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 that's true. Because yes. yes. every family has a different DNA. Now I work on these two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the husband of both of them, only one of them. <laughs> no, one of them is my husband. Ah. All right, I'm answering these two questions with one answer. What do you have in the world more? Glass or diamonds? Very, very little diamonds. Diamond. You gotta dig and suffer so much until you find a bunch of diamonds. But glass you have all over, all over the world. But do you so what, what, what do you have more in the world? You use stones and sand or gold? You have stone and sand. Why did God choose only one family to be his nation and not the rest of the world? It's not a correct question. This question comes out of lack of knowledge. Why? Because God never chose us because this is what he wanted. That's the circumstances that happened in the world that made him make this decision. And I'll explain what I mean. When God created Adam and Eve, his intention was that all their descendants will receive the Torah and it's going to be all one nation. That was the right plan. But in order for people to receive the truth of God, they have to sweat to gain it, as we saw with Abraham. The, go the Adam and Eve, right away, they had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a murderer. Him and his descendant lost the merit of receiving the Torah. They cannot be chosen people anymore because they already murdered. So him is out of the picture. Few generations later, we get to the time of Noah. Noah had three sons, one righteous, two wicked. The two wicked ones are out of the picture. Shem is staying. Few generations after Shem, we have Abraham. Abraham had Yitzchak and Ishmael. Ishmael was wicked, as the Torah say, wild beast. The Torah called Ishmael a wild beast. You see what the Arabs that came from him, what they do to the world today. The Torah say, Pere Adam, Yado, Bakol, Veyat, Kolbo. And the Torah say, was worship idols. Ishmael is out of the picture. Yitzchak. Yitzchak have Yaakov and Esav. Esav is wicked. Esav is out of the picture. Who left? Yaakov. Yaakov have all his children, all of them righteous. The Torah say, each one of them is a tribe that is righteous. God said, now it's the time to give my Torah. He sent them to 210 years preparation in Egypt. He made them down to earth, slaves, nothing. No freedom, no money, no nothing. After the Jews were nothing, like dust in the wind, then he said, now it's the time of redemption, now it's the salvation, I get you out and I'm giving you the Torah. After he took them out, he gave them the Torah. Now remember, there is no discriminations against the Gentiles. Every non-Jew today that wants to convert has the right to do so. I happen to convert more than 10 or 12 people already in my life, even though I'm doing everything I can not to convert non-Jews for their own benefits. Why? Because it's much harder to be a Jew than a Goy. Many times I convince them to stay Goyim and keep the seven laws of Noah, and they have a, a, a part to the world to come. It's limited because their test is much easier but at least they're righteous Gentile. 
a Jew that does not keep the Torah is in a much worse situation than a Goy that keeps the same law. Because the Goy fulfills his, his potential 100%. A Jew that only does 10%, he did not fulfill his potential 90%. He has a serious problem. That's why I convinced a lot of these Goyim. However, sometimes the Goyim fought me without, they didn't give me a chance until I sent them to the rabbis and they, and they converted them. So that's one thing. A Jew that was chosen is still conditional. The Jews are not automatically the chosen people like most Jews think. The Torah gave in more than 30 places a, a serious condition. If you are going to be faithful to me, if you're going to listen to my laws, if you're going to follow my mitzvot and do it with all your heart and all your soul, then you are a special nation to me and I chose you from all the nation. That means if you don't, you're nothing special, no chosen people, no nothing. But according to you, you only said only 10% of us actually observe it. Right. So the, three times. So 90% of us are... Mr. We Cohen, one Mr. Point. Cohen, I want to ask you a question. 14 years ago, I tell you and out of, excuse me, out of that 1.3 or whatever percent, the 10 percent of the Jews of the Hasidic that go three times and everything, a right. whole lot of them go to the news, the ones that that, that do all kinds of unethical things. Right. Depends what the ones that right. every person that has a beard and has beautiful pears and a nice sombrero, that doesn't mean he's a righteous person. Being righteous is not determined of how long is your beard and what's the size of your yarmulke. That's not what makes you righteous or wicked. There are certain crimes that Jews making and it still give them belongs to the Jewish nations. There are certain crimes that they go against God that they, with their own hands, cut themselves out of the nation of God. I'll give you an example. Which brings me to this point. I'll give you an that example. Out of that 99.8%, if only one percent of them are decent human beings, yes. they far outweigh the. And we know that more than one percent of them, because the laws of the. I, I, I want to tell you, look, if you would make all the non Jews Jews, then if you have X amount of diamonds in the world, and now all of a sudden I'm going to get into the market another billion diamonds. What's going to happen to all the existing uh, diamonds? The They're going to go down to be two dollars a piece. This simulation is totally irrelevant. It's a comparison of your human beings. It's a joke, it's a joke. Animals, no, 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 Thank you very much. Wait, wait, let me up. Let me be serious. All right. Okay, listen. Every guy that wants to become a Jew, if he's serious, everyone who wants can become a Jew. We don't say, no, you're a guy, you cannot. We have black Jews, you, you know? know what Chinese my main Jew. question is okay. all of this. So I answer your question. My main, my yeah. main question is that, yeah. are we making the, uh, these speeches and these things that yes. we are the chosen ones, and we are, Kind of, it kind of resembles. We don't do it in front of the queen. It kind of resembles what uh, Hitler was saying that we are the chosen one. You did see, not listen to my, what I told my, 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 my I told them if we are doing are it, we, you're right. If God is doing it, what okay. do you want? Okay. I have no story. Are we, no, I just have this All question. the goyim that I met told me by the line, you are the chosen people. One question. You want to say what they are? They agree that we are the my chosen people. My final question. Why it bothers you? My father. Are we making that 99.8% are enemies by saying that we are the chosen ones and you are nobody? Okay. The question... And, and this has been the history of the world right, that you're right. we always we are, turn them... We, add, we add oil to the fire by saying exactly. it. Exactly. Okay, but who told us to do it? Come on. Okay, wait. Mr. So Cohen. Right. Mr. You Cohen. Mr. Cohen. I didn't see anything scientific. Mr. Cohen, you forgot one detail. Just one. <laughs> one detail you forgot. What's that? When the Goy, the Muslim, or the Christian open up the Torah, mm -hmm. he, not like you, he, wait, let me finish. What? He does not deny that this is the word of God. True or false? Christians and Muslims say this is the word of God. Yes. What can I do? Me, Mr. Mizrahi, and you, Mr. Cohen, 
that God wrote in the Torah that Jews for me is the sunshine of the world. This is my children. They are holy. I love them more than I love all the nations. What can I do? I got lucky. Well, you don't get it? Why are you so upset? It's only the point of two tenths of a percent. The other 99.8% don't believe that.